Thank you everyone for joining in. Um, my name is Alvaro Perez and I'm a harm reduction specialist at EOCIL. And today we're gonna to be opening up the discussion around HIV. And I'm more than happy to have our guest speaker here with us, Dr. Christopher Evans. If, if you just wanna introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you for uh, giving me this um, opportunity to talk about something I'm very passionate about. So um, yes, my name is Chris Evans. I am an infectious disease um, doctor at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. And I'm also the lead physician for the HIV clinic there. So we um, have a large HIV positive um, community and we provide both primary care as well as consults for, um, for patients. And so, yeah, that's my, my main hat. All right. Oh, that's awesome. And how long have um, you kind of been in that field of work? Gosh, I'm dating myself here. Uh, <laughs> I could probably say since, um, you know, starting probably in medical school, I would probably see the late 90s to uh, uh, 2000. So, yeah, I've been doing this for a long time. Kind of what, what drew you into that field when, like, deciding what career path to go? Um, great question. Um, I think it's been a journey, um, you know, where I trained on the East Coast, you know, there were, you know, when I was a medical student, there were very many times that the people who were in the hospital looked like me. And, you know, I saw my, you know, my community reflected in, um, in these patients. And so I, you know, it really sort of, um, it really made me want to make a contribution as well as to be part of a solution, whatever that looked like. Um, and it's been a very um, satisfying career because, you know, uh, you know, from, you know, the advent of being able to diagnose HIV to being able to treat HIV, to getting down to single tablet regimens, to getting now down to possible injections, um, we've come a long way. And, you know, the fact that we have um, babies who were, are, are being born to HIV positive women who are HIV negative. I mean, it's, it's, we've come a long way. So, yeah. Yeah. And no, that's awesome. And no, I really like that because similar to myself, like, cause I'm new to this kind of area of work before in the past during my high school and early college days, I was just a labor labor jobs. So I was outside doing whatever I could, raking leaves, mowing lawns, worked in a wood shop. And then, um, I got into this position that I am now and, you know, seeing the numbers where the Hispanic community and the African American community, they have some like the highest numbers yeah. out here. And especially because the the healthcare that's provided to them isn't really accessible. Yeah. So when I first started, you know, it was really nice knowing that I could be a solution to help my people, like the Latinx community, and be a voice for them to get them the representation that they need and deserve like anyone else. So no, it's really awesome to be able to work somewhere where you you can impact your community and your culture. So that's awesome. We're going to be talking about um, HIV. And I'll be honest, when I first started, I, I knew what HIV was. I wasn't super in detail, but I knew it was a disease you got through. And this is my assumption at the time was sleeping around with a lot of people, having sexual intercourse with people with multiple partners that would cause you to get HIV. And I had HIV and AIDS kind of mixed in the same group just because I wasn't really familiar with what it was. So I don't know, kind of kind of help me walk through that process. Like what is HIV? Like where did it start out from? So um, great question. So um, give you a little bit of history. So, um, you know, it's theorized that HIV um, probably started out as a virus that was in um, non-human um, uh, populations, so probably um, in um, simian populations. And for maybe whatever reason, it may have jumped from um, that population to humans. We're not sure what happened or how it happened, but it's possible there. Um, the reason why I say that is because if we look at, say, certain monkey populations, simian populations, there is um, a, a parallel virus, the simian um, immunodeficiency virus, so it's very similar to HIV. That said, um, we uh, recognized in the early 80s that um, there were people who were showing up um, in hospitals with uh, severe immunodeficiencies. 
Um, and these were things that we didn't see to particularly, in, especially um, in populations who didn't really have any sort of known risk, like they weren't in therapy and so forth, but these people unfortunately were coming in with really, really severe illnesses, um, cystis, um, and which is a pneumonia that people get when their immune systems are very low. That said, that what led to sort of, you know, um, a race to kind of diagnose the virus. And then in it, it initially, um, you know, the HIV was sort of a gradual um, uh, sort of progression of the name. The first name, which was fortunate name was GRID, which people might have known as gay related immunodeficiency, which was horrible because it stigmatized people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and finally, it um, the name that people uh, developed was, was HIV, human immune um, deficiency um, virus. And, uh, you know, the difference between HIV and AIDS is really a, a technical issue rather than um, an absolute. So for HIV or for AIDS, we typically think of AIDS um, as um, anyone who has a low immune system and it's measured by CD4 count below 200. Or if you've ever had an opportunistic infection, um, as I mentioned, um, cryptococcal meningitis, or if you've ever had a, um, we call it AIDS-related um, malignancy or disease. So things like uh, certain lymphomas are uh, thought to be HIV related. And so therefore, even if you had a CD4 count that was high, if you had um, lymphoma, a certain type of lymphoma, uh, that would be considered an AIDS diagnosis. It doesn't mean that once someone gets diagnosed with AIDS that they will, you know, their CD4 count will be low. Uh, typically, we start people on medications um, at any CD4 count, and then hopefully their CD4 count goes up and above and stays above. Unfortunately, um, the sort of the technical definition is that once someone gets diagnosed with AIDS, even if their CD4 count goes above 200 is still considered AIDS. But again, I think most people would argue that, you know, someone who had a AIDS diagnosis 10 years ago and now has a CD4 count of five, 600 is really not the same risk as someone who still has a CD4 count below 200. So they're two different populations. Yeah, okay. And, and what does that kind of look like? Cause you were saying uh, an immune deficiency or- Yeah. Right. So if someone were to have HIV, there's no like physical symptoms that you can see that you can identify someone who has it. That's just more like an internal thing that's happening within their blood, right? Yeah, I mean, it, there's no way you can sort of look at someone and say, oh, that person's HIV positive. Um, uh, you know, there are what we call stigmata that people who are um, have really low immune systems can get. So one of the things that was so stigmatizing to folks and still continue, we continue to see something called KS, Kaposi sarcoma, which was a um, a skin cancer that, or actually it's a cancer, a lot of times people see these purplish uh, lesions on their skin. Um, and so again, but, you know, as you said, no one can sort of pick someone up and say, hey, this person is HIV positive. Um, I will say though, sort of pivoting back to um, something you mentioned before about, um, you know, thinking about HIV as something where, you know, if you had a lot of partners and so forth. And I think that's one of the thing I think things that I think continues to stigmatize um, people and stigmatize populations. I, I can tell you that I've met patients who have had 500, 600 partners and are not HIV positive. And I've met people who have had one partner and are HIV positive. It really doesn't matter how many partners you have. It really matters um, who those partners are and if that partner is HIV positive and not controlled on HIV medications, that is the risk. And so, um, you know, HIV can be transmitted through sex, it can be transmitted through sharing needles, and in rare circumstances, which we don't see here in the United States much anymore, uh, it can be transmitted from from mother to child. Um, and so, um, you know, those are primarily, we used to also see it through blood transfusions, but we screen the blood supply. Um, so that's no longer an issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really important thing to point out that it's nothing that anyone has done wrong. Um, it is just a, a, a risk and an encounter that unfortunately um, made them um, HIV positive. And it's nothing that they should be blamed for um, at any, in any circumstance. Yeah. And, you know, like I mentioned before, and I love that you touched around like the stigma portion because 
I had those same ideas. I can learn from my mistakes. I've grown and matured and done my research now to know that what I thought in the past isn't exactly what I think now. And, you know, the harm that stigma can do, because I've done quite a bit of research now. I've watched videos where people give their testimonials about how they were treated, how they were excluded from certain activities, even from just being in the same living quarters, they were removed from that situation because they thought that just through, just through air that they would pass that. What harm does that kind of do for people who live with HIV? Um, have you seen like the effects of it? Like people coming into the office are dropping or just them not wanting to get help because this this whole idea of what HIV is. Definitely. Great question. You know, I've heard just some horrible, horrible stories. Um, you know, people who go home to see family and family may not want to share the same fork or the same glass with them, which makes no sense because I always ask them, like, does your family go to Applebee's? And they say, yeah. It's like, do they ask who used the last glass or fork? And I say, no. Well, okay, you don't pass HIV from sharing utensils. Um, you know, I think this leads to um, people not wanting to disclose their status. Um, it also leads to people maybe, maybe not wanting to take their medications in front of family. And of course, we know that when you don't take medications, um, your virus is going to replicate and then you can get into more serious trouble with your immune system. So I think there's just many different steps. I think when you live in small communities, where everyone knows each other, that's a bigger issue when you, than when you live in large metro areas. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it, it, it's really compounded stigma um, for people, again, which again, we, and the way I think about HIV is that I think about many other illnesses is that we need to provide you with um, adequate, competent, compassionate care as we do for anything else. And no one should be stigmatized for being HIV positive. Yeah, I totally agree with that because I even recently I was just scrolling through my phone and I came across um, it was kind of like a little mini series about a woman who and the title was pretty it got my interest. It said born with HIV mm. and I didn't know that was a thing. And you touched on it um, briefly that you can be born with HIV you can pass from mother to child. Mm -hmm. So I clicked on that video and just watched it. And it was this whole story about this lady who who struggled her entire life with HIV and living with the stigma that people thought she was dirty um, mm -hmm. because they didn't know that it could be passed from mother to to child. And mm -hmm. I thought that was like really important as well because it can really, really affect people like mentally mm -hmm. knowing that everyone's judging them, especially if they come from a small community. And mm -hmm. we've noticed here, especially in like Eastern Oregon, mm -hmm. that the smaller communities are, um, are a little bit higher risk just because they don't have the resources. And it is such a, a small tight knit group where everyone knows everyone, you know, your neighbor's neighbor, um, by first name basis. And it's kind of scary to um, have all those people know your your status and then not to feel judged by those people and then be excluded from from your home. Mm -hmm. So definitely. You know, it's definitely, definitely eye opening. And, you know, just hearing the, the stories from the videos that I've seen where people are just treated so poorly. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, I really, you know, want to touch on something you said, you know, the words dirty and clean are just so stigmatizing. Um, you know, it's it, it's it's wrong, I think, to use words and to divide people in those categories in any way. Um, people have an infection. And yeah. as you said, we need care and we should do that. Um, also pivoting to something you said about, um, you know, being stigmatized in communities. I think there are two different buckets. There's one about people who know they're positive um, and, you know, have barriers to taking medications because of stigma, not wanting to disclose. But the other bucket is people who may suspect that they're positive and not wanting to get diagnosed. Um, because they think, you know, um, if you have to go to the health department or other places and get tested, you know, even if your test is negative, people, um, I think there's a lot of folks that think that that says something about them that they're getting an HIV test. And my goal, as I talk to everyone about this, is that getting tested for HIV should be as routine as getting tested for diabetes or getting <laughs> getting your cholesterol check. It's just another test. And um, I think that anyone 18 and over who's sexually active or even below, if you're sexually active below um, before 18, should get an HIV test at least one. Um, and so again, it should be as a routine conversation. Hey, I'm getting blood work done in your provider's office. Hey, the CDC makes this recommendation for routine testing. Do you want me just to add an HIV test? Has nothing to do with, you know, saying anything about you. This is just a routine test. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, I know here, uh, especially our office here in um, Ontario, and we have three other locations as well, one in Pendleton, one in the Dalles, and then Burns. Um, and we have these take-home tests. And I didn't know when I first started how simple it was. Um, you would just come in and the ones we have, you just do a quick little test on yourself, takes 20 minutes to get the results. And then from there, if it's positive, then we'll re refer you to a clinic to get actual blood test just to make sure it's not a false positive. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I didn't know how quick and simple a quick like take home test kit could be. Yeah. Um, yeah so um, do you guys have similar stuff at your guys' um, office? We don't do a lot of test self testing in our clinic a lot of times because a lot of folks who are seeing this um, already diagnosed, um, but you know we have the ability to test people. Usually, we send them to our lab, and they can get a test. Um, I will say too that remember that there are different types of tests, and so I think it's really important to understand the characteristics of those tests when you take them. So we know that um, when someone gets exposed to HIV, that you know if you got a test, say two days later, your test may be negative. Um, you know, the tests pick up certain aspects of the virus and those specific aspects may not be at a level that the test can pick up or that the test does pick up in the first place. Um, and so I realized that, you know, getting a negative test at point A may not necessarily mean that you are negative because it really depends on what test you're using and when that test was done. And so I always sort of um, emphasize that if you feel that the test was done too early or the type of test doesn't pick that up, you should get retested again and not to just assume that your one-time test is negative. Yeah, for sure. That's really good to know. Um, sorry, because I've taken a couple of training courses for like different test kits and stuff like that, but definitely getting in, going in and getting blood work drawn to just make sure and just going in like frequently, like you said, um, make it a regular routine thing. Nothing could be better than just to make sure you're living a healthy life. That's all we, we want for everyone. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, just coming in routinely. And what, what would you recommend, like, for someone to come in who's sexually active on a regular basis? Um, is it like a once a year thing or come in three months, quarterly? I feel, um, you know, at least once a year and um, anytime you want to get tested. <laughs> yeah. The frequency to it. Um, I think that if you're sexually active, and you want to get tested, um, you know, get tested, go and get tested. Um, you know, I also think too, that if you're sexually active, um, you know, you should also get tested for other um, possible infections. The big ones that we're seeing um, having a big uptick here in Oregon are syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. Um, and so, you know, you should get tested for those other infections too, because having one STI, say, for example, syphilis does dramatically increase your risk for getting HIV. And so getting diagnosed, getting treated will decrease your risk um, with that. Um, and of course, I think when we see people coming in for testing, I think it also allows the um, opportunity to have a conversation about prevention, whether or not that prevention is from PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis, where you take a specific medication daily to prevent you from getting HIV or from just safe sex practices, um, whatever that looks like. Um, and so, you know, these are conversations that I think should be routine and no one should be stigmatized about asking to get a test in the first place. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I like that you touch on the kind of like the steps after if you do, be, if you do find out that you're HIV positive, is that PrEP mm -hmm. and PEP? I was like doing my research, just seeing like, where we come with the advancement in medication and stuff like that from like back in the day where there really wasn't anything where you were just diagnosed and you were told that lay in your bed and that's pretty much it to where now we're take this medication where you take a pill once a day for prep so there are different types of uh prep so there's two pills and then there is an injectable that just got released um you know one pill is called Travada. The other pill is called Discovy, and the injectable is called Apertude. Um, the two pills, um, um, the two pills, Travada and Discovy, are you, can be used in people who were um, born um, biologically male, um, and so um, you know you can take that once a day. Um, there are some. Um, there are some leeways for using Travada in what they call on demand, but I think that's a very specific discussion you should probably have with your provider if that's the route that you go. 
And then for um, people um, born biologically female, um, Travada is the only option or Apertude. Apertude is the um, injectable that you take every two months. And that, as I said, just came out. And then we have Travada, which is now generic. So there are lots of options for people to get access um, at a lower cost. I don't know, is it, is it a, a long period of time to take that? Um, so once you get diagnosed with HIV, that's a, is that a lifetime medication situation where you take, you're taking it every day? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, which, you know, we always are kind of looking for the holy grail of treatment and, 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 uh, and cure, but we're just not there yet. Um, so for right now, anyone who's diagnosed as HIV positive has to take medication um, as a lifetime and for viral suppression. Um, and I think there are two benefits that come with taking medications for treatment of HIV. One is that it suppresses your viral load and will hopefully increases your immune system, your CD4 count. But then we've also come to a point in um, talking about HIV where we know that if you are undetectable, meaning that we can't measure the virus uh, at any um, any clinically significant levels. Um, we know that if you're undetectable, if you have a negative partner, no matter what type of sex you choose to have, um, there's no transmission between the person who's HIV positive and undetectable and the person who's HIV negative. So the mantra is U equals U or undetectable equals untransmittable. And so I feel we've come a long way in terms of being able to have these conversations with our patients. It's awesome, and that's for um, with prep, which is pre pre exposure prophylaxis, right? No. So when we talk about U equals U, we're talking about people who are known to be HIV positive. Um, when we talk about prep, then that's for folks that are known to be HIV negative. Okay. Uh, and so um, prep is given to folks who um, feel that they're at risk for getting an HIV infection, and so um, they. Initially, that could be through sex, or that could also be through shared needles, or um, uh, and so they could take uh, either Travada um, for everyone, uh, Descovy for some people, or then Apertude, like that's just not approved, which is the injectable. And typically, that comes with a certain amount of monitoring, where you get an HIV test every three months, and also recommended is to get other STI testing, such as syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. Just remember too that when you do a gonorrhea and chlamydia test, you have to test at any side of exposure. So whether or not that's uh, back of the throat from oral sex, whether or not it's rectal exposure, whether that's penile vaginal exposure, you have to test each area and can't assume that an infection um, not in the back of the mouth doesn't mean that you don't have an infection in the rectum. So you have to swab and, and do that. Um, and so, yeah, you do HIV testing every three months, you do STI testing every two, three months, and then you monitor uh, things like kidney function. Um, in some folks, you monitor pregnancy. Um, and we know these medications are safe for most people. Um, and so, you know, it's something that if you feel you're at risk, you should have that conversation with your, with your doctor. And then PEP is basically if you got an exposure, um, typically the cases that come up are a needle stick while you're drawing blood, something maybe you work in healthcare, or unfortunately see that in sexual assaults. So someone who was sexually assaulted would take um, basically an HIV regimen, a full HIV regimen, so not just Travada, uh, possibly Travada and another medication called uh, Raltegravir, and you take that for about four weeks. Uh, typically we test you after the exposure, and then we should be testing you again um, at uh, four weeks and then also at three months. So you get a couple of different tests to make sure that you still remain HIV negative after the exposure. And then again, if you think that you're still a continued at risk, then to have that conversation about transitioning from post-exposure prophylaxis to PrEP, where you would take either Travada or Discovy or maybe in some cases, Apertude. Okay, yeah. And um, when you find out that you have been exposed, what's the time frame that you, you need to start taking those precautions and, and finding out yeah. whether or not to take that PEP? Yeah, that's a really good question. So it's a 72-hour window. Um, so uh, typically I see, you know, 
if you need to get PEP, the, probably the easiest place to get it would be in the emergency room because they're open all the, all the time <laughs> rather than going and making an appointment with your doctor's office um, because that appointment may be delayed. There's not a lot of evidence that um, PEP works uh, after that 72 hour window. Because you think about it, if you unfortunately were exposed, then, um, you know, it, you know, the virus has a certain amount of time to replicate. And what you're trying to do is to give the person medications to prevent the virus from replicating and establishing latency or establishing sort of a, a, a sort of a reservoir for infection. So it's typically a 72 hour window. Um, don't go, don't go up to 72 hours. I would say <laughs> earlier, the better. So as soon as you can get um, PEP, then get it. And again, it's going to be typically um, two drugs, usually say Truvada and, um, and Rautegravir, which you take twice per day. And you do that for four weeks. You test at the beginning, at the end. And then again, you probably want to test about uh, three months just to make sure the person still remains negative. And kind of what's... Um... How effective is it when you take pre uh, PEP? Is it um... highly effective? Yeah, it's highly effective. Um, you know, we don't see a lot of cases of um, post-exposure seroconversion. Um, you know, in our practice, so we know that it's effective. But again, I think the thing that comes up more often is that um, sometimes by the time people are referred to us. Um, which they really shouldn't because, you know, it's going to take a while to get in to see us. Um, the, 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 they're outside that window, that 72 hour window. So um, as I said, it's probably something that if you feel that you had a high risk exposure, whatever that is, then you get to some sort of urgent care setting where they're going to be able to prescribe you the medication, do the baseline testing. And then the most important thing is to have the follow up testing after you're on the medication. And again, sort of going forward in time. Okay. And what does that process look like? Because I know, I know me personally, you know, that would seem kind of scary. It seems like you'd fill out a lot of paperwork, you have to sign so many things. What's the process between um, either getting onto PrEP or asking your, your physician if PrEP is right for you or getting on PEP? What does that look like if someone wants to, um, yeah. you know, embark in that? I think it really depends on access. And, you know, of course, access in, in here in the United States is probably limited by being insured. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, we all have to sort of, you know, go through that door. Um, so, you know, getting on PrEP, so pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, meaning that you feel that you're at risk for getting HIV because of um, ongoing exposures, um, then you would probably talk to your provider. I heard there's some places have um, PrEP navigators that they can sort of get people connected to providers in the community that give PrEP. And then for PEP, um, that again is uh, seeing someone who can see within that 72 hour window. Um, but, you know, getting the four, month, four weeks of, of HIV meds sometimes is a barrier. Sometimes people may have high copays. Sometimes, you know, they're, you know, they have a high deductible um, that makes getting the medication um, unattainable. So I feel like we still have a lot of a long way to go to make sure that everyone can get access to these medications in a equitable and timely manner to do what they're meant to do. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. And kind of like touching on the, getting access, what are kind of some of the barriers that you've seen for people who are trying to get access to PEP, like yeah. through the different um, the minority groups? Kind of what barriers have you seen that that are pretty present and prevalent? and people getting access to that and kind of like, what are your thoughts on trying to figure out a solution, so to say? I know a solution is kind of a big thing because there's so much that goes into it, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, great question. Um, you know, I, as I said, insurance is probably the biggest barrier. Um, uh, connecting with um, a knowledgeable provider that knows how to prescribe these medications. So a lot of times making sure that you are on the right medication and that you have the right follow-up. Um, I think also um, uh, for some of our unhoused uh, folks, um, you know, being able to have adequate follow-up, um, you know, you know, uh, I think people who um, have, you know, ongoing um, 
you know, risks where they just are not reachable for, you know, getting their next HIV test or, or so forth. I mean, so there are just many different individual factors that kind of can prevent someone from getting access to these meds. Um, but the biggest ones I've probably seen are insurance driven. Do you, do you see it kind of, you know, hopefully being more accessible just because it is such a severe thing, especially like in the state of Oregon where numbers are increasing? Um, do you kind of see it later on? You know, I, I'd like to say close down the road, but, you know, one can only keep the fingers crossed for so long. But do you see that kind of dropping where it'd be more more feasible for people to get it? Or is it kind of right now we're at a standstill with... Yeah. with are you talking about PrEP or are you talking about PEP? PrEP. PrEP and both. both kind of both in similar... Yeah. Um, so I would say for PrEP, there are probably um, more options, um, more health care um, organizations and plans are covering PrEP, so pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, PEP is, I think, a very different thing because it's not something that's utilized very much, um, fortunately, because um, again, these come in very, very specific clinical scenarios, again, whether or not these are needle sticks or whether or not these are sexual assaults or something, whatever that is an exposure, an unintended exposure to HIV. Um, you know, those can be sometimes um, a little bit more difficult because the medications are more expensive. And um, of course, if you get access to the medication or you don't have access to a medical provider that can give you that follow-up, then there's just many different things. A lot of folks that are young that are not even connected to a primary care provider. So where do you go to get that four-week follow-up? Where do you go to get that 12-week follow-up? Uh, if you have side effects with the medications, who do you have a conversation with? So um, I still think that that needs a better, um, better access and diff different, different and better access points for people to be able to get access to the medications. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then and you just touched about it right now towards the end is like the follow up because I'm still learning and, you know, I want to be able to, when someone comes into our office, because we do help if someone wants to get tested, we can help them find the resources that they need, get them the proper test kits, get them the, the proper um, prevention tools for like follow-up cases. How important is it for people to follow up? Like, and how many times do they have to follow up with like their, with their clinician or with their doctor? Yeah, I think, I think the fact is that, you know, there are many different barriers to follow up. Um, you know, I think that, you know, the follow-up can be a little bit difficult because of course, you know, people may not feel, um, safe having conversations with their primary care provider about, about the fact that they're on a medication to either prevent HIV or for whatever reason. And so, you know, we have to, we have to create safe spaces um, to have these conversations without any judgment or stigma for anyone. And I think that will go a long way for people being able to disclose and to be their authentic selves and to have those conversations. Yeah, I know. I definitely get that because especially here in our office, that's our main thing is making sure everyone feels welcome to come in and they're not worried that once they leave here that people are going to um, know why they came in here for. So especially in my office, I'm going to be getting a, a needle bending machine. So for, for people who inject drugs, they can come in and get new needles. I'll write them down so that way they're not at risk of spreading HIV in that way. Mm -hmm. And so everything in my office is kind of just really really simple nothing super out there in your face where it says hiv test kits free needle like none of that that way people can come in feel safe that when they leave and someone sees them leave they don't exactly know you know why they came here for because i know that's a big thing is if you go into a clinic that's labeled hiv test kits and you see people going in and out then people oh. in the surrounding areas are going to start to wonder and start forming these ideas about that person and you know, just making sure people feel welcome and know that it's safe to come in here, that they're not going to yeah. be discriminated, they're not going to be stigmatized, that there's no fear of people finding out, you know, yeah. what they're doing. I mean, I feel that the best thing we talk about, I think the the denominator for all of these um, services is harm reduction. Um, it's all about making sure that you're healthy, you're safe. And it shouldn't be about stigmatizing anything or people's behaviors or so forth. It's all about, I want you to be safe. I want you to live a long, healthy life yeah. and love who you want to love. And, you know, if people um, have 
you know, ongoing substance use, we treat it as a disease. We treat it as something where people need help and to give people um, options. You know, not everyone may be at that point where they're um, able to have a conversation about quitting, but you leave the door open and you provide ways for them to stay safe. So um, I am a strong, strong proponent of um, needle exchange programs for clean needles because we want people to, again, remain safe. Yeah, and, and the great thing is is we we already have a vending machine in our um, Pendleton office that's that's run by uh, Chrysanthia Weatherspoon. She's also um, a fellow coworker of mine that works in the harm reduction area. Um, we do a lot of like Narcan training, safe injection training, um, things of that nature. And then um, I'm going to be getting my needle vending machine here as well, so I can be able to do that in the Ontario office. And yeah, no, that's a, that's a really big thing because I remember, and it brings up these videos that I've been just researching just like on YouTube where people tell their stories where um, they find out that they're HIV positive and they're a little bit older. So kind of their knowledge, the knowledge around HIV was kind of scarce, but they were always worried that their life was over, that they couldn't find a, a partner anymore because the risk of passing it on to them was so high that they thought they weren't worthy of finding a companion in life. And, yeah. you know, I thought that was quite, you know, quite yeah. sad in a sense, just because that's just not the case. Um, not there's, there's ways to get get around that where you where you equals you, yeah. and that you can live a healthy life like normal. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, I know that's one of those um, really um, tough conversations, especially for people uh, establishing new relationships. It's about disclosure. Um, when do I disclose? Who do I disclose to? How do I disclose? And I don't think I've had any um, mag magical answers for that because I think it's really individually driven um, about sort of having that conversation with whoever you want to sort of share your um, share your medical information with. Um, and so, you know, you know, as I said, I, I think the good thing again is that U equals U um, in terms of sex, because again, U equals U does not necessarily apply to sharing needles. It applies only to sex. Um, and so if you are in a relationship with someone who's HIV negative, you know that um, whatever type of sex you have or choose to have, um, if you are undetectable, we, you know, there's no transmission between the person who's HIV positive and the person who's HIV negative without condoms. Yeah. yeah and, and that brings up like another topic that I was thinking because I was doing my research, just finding out like questions from the community going online, just seeing what people are asking about HIV. And I saw a lot of ones, which maybe to you, because into your professional might seem kind of, kind of um, simple. But a lot of the questions that I saw that people were asking online was, "Can you get H Can you get HIV from someone who's HIV negative and you're negative?" That's that's not a that's not a thing, right? <laughs> don't that's have what, infection. You can't give the infection. Yeah. So that pass the virus if you don't have the virus. So that's yeah. yeah. And I, I chuckled at that too because I spent some time searching and I read. I was like. Um, I wonder if they actually mean that. And I kept looking and I kept seeing there was yeah. quite a bit of people who kept asking that same question, same question. Can I, my partner's HIV negative, I'm HIV negative, we're really sexually active, is there any risk? And I just read that and I chuckled, but that, that might be kind yeah. of like. I would say, so there are a couple of things I would say about that, just kind of give context to the question. If there's no HIV in a sort of bi-directional relationship, there's no HIV. So there's people don't spontaneously develop HIV. But if you have, you know, everyone has different different sort of relationships. So if you are in a relationship that's an open relationship where you may have um, partners that are unknown status, so you don't know if they're HIV positive or HIV negative, that person may be positive and not on medications, you may not know, or that person may be positive and unknown about what their status is. And so they are not on medications for that reason, then that is a risk. That is a risk for uh, transmission of HIV. Because again, that person may be detectable and have a high viral load. And then of course, sex is a easy way to transmit the virus in that way. Um, and so it really depends on sort of who your partners are and what those relationships really look like. Um, Another thing too is to think about risk is that, you know, your risk is your, who your partner is. So if you are in a relationship with someone and that person is your only partner, but that partner has multiple partners, then by proxy, you are still at risk. 
And so again, it really does come down to really thinking about this. It's not necessarily the number of partners you have, it's basically who those partners are and what risks do those partners bring to the, to the relationship that then increase your risk by sort of that, that direction. And so, you know, I think it's really important to have that because I've had folks say, oh, you know, I only have one partner. I'm like, great, wonderful. Uh, that works for you. Um, do you know if that person is your, if that person uh, has you as their only partner or do they have other partners? And they say, you know what? I'm not sure, or you know what? Yeah, my wife or my um, partner has outside relationships. So therefore that then makes you at risk in, in terms of that. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, I'm gonna put that on the table. Yeah, and I think that would, that would cause that, that would bring me to kind of like the education system on, on where, like, when is it okay to discuss about this? I know when I was in high school and granted I'm only 22, so I haven't been out of high school for that long, <laughs> but from what I remember is we didn't really have, I didn't take a single sex ed class. There wasn't a sexual education class offered in my high school that I'm aware of. I remember I took a, a small little week long in middle school. We just yeah. talked about the simple basic birds and the bees yeah, and that was it. And just like getting this to the people, like especially the younger people, so they know that they, that they should be practicing safe sex, that they should be safe. They should be aware of, you know, what the possibilities are that to at least get it ingrained in them that it is okay to get checked for HIV, to get checked on a regular basis if you're sexually active. Because I know I, I didn't learn any of that in high school. Yeah. We shouldn't, you know, I, I think one of the things that I think we as a society get wrong is that not talking about it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't happen. Um, not talking about safe sex doesn't mean that people are not going to look up online how to have sex and maybe some of the information that they're getting online is not the most accurate information. Um, and then, of course, that may lead to um, poor decision making. And so I, I think that, you know, as the saying goes, knowledge is power. You need, need to empower people, give them the tools so that you can make um, decisions that are for them, for their relationships whatever those relationships look like and not necessarily say, well, because we don't talk about it because we don't have um, these conversations that don't exist. There are many um, adolescents that um, are sexually active. It's a fact. And so if they're sexually active, just like we talk about harm reduction, what kinds of conversations do we need to have so that we um, avoid unintended um, circumstances, whether or not those are STIs and so forth. And so we need to have those conversations and not hide those conversations in the back closet or whatever and say, well, you know, we're not going to talk about it. It's, it's not appropriate. No, people are having sex and we need to be sure that we give them the tools to make the best decisions for their health. Yeah, definitely opening up that discussion and, you know, kind of taking a stand from like a Hispanic family. Cause I know the, the Hispanic culture is really, you don't talk about it with, mm -hmm. with your parents. It just, it is what it is. You don't bring up that conversation they kind of just expect you to no, no, yeah. don't be messing around. Don't be doing all these other things and kind of like even this, um, just being honest, like I told my parents that what I work mm -hmm. and my, my father, he's, he's pretty old school in that sense where he was kind of like, why are you working there? Like those people like mm -hmm. don't be working. And, and, you know, I don't, want to kind of like judge him because that's the way he grew up he's a lot older and those are the ideologies from back in the day and you know now that i've been here for quite some time i've been able to like have conversation and he's been able to understand me more and more the more i talk about it the more i educate him on the topic and he's he's changed so much throughout the entire time that i've been here and yeah. just having a simple conversation opening up because i know the the hispanic community primarily like we don't talk about sexual education about you know who who, who our sexual partners are in that discussion. And that's really important. And just, you know, letting people know that it is a serious thing. If you want to live a long, happy, healthy life, just talk exactly. about it. It's, it's, it's just the way yeah. it is. I mean, knowledge is power. And so, you know, I think that when people know their status, when they're, um, someone's positive, then they make decisions around that. They, a lot of times those decisions are, I need to get connected to care. I need to start taking medications. Uh, taking medications improves your health, of course, also decreases risk of transmission when you become undetectable. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this long enough that I have seen people of every shade and stripe 
<laughs> every sort of racial background, every um, ethnicity, every cultural diversity, most cultural diversities. I've seen people from all over the world who've um, come into my clinic. I've seen people very, very young, uh, just out of high school to uh, very, very old and retired and settled in um, as new diagnosis. Um, I've seen people with who have uh, English as their primary language. I've had people who have other languages as a primary language. This, um, this infection can affect anyone. Um, I've had people who are probably, I would say, very, very well off monetarily. And I've had people who um, are struggling um, because of um, um, with, from, um, financially. It doesn't, HIV does not sort of have like, you know, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to be within your community only. It affects anyone. And granted, there are people who probably have more resources, um, probably can afford to get the testing more often, or, or you know, if they're um, if they're not uh, changing jobs, they may have more stable insurance or something like that. I mean, there's just many different things that can affect people's lives. And so I think we need to make sure that everyone gets the message. And from that message, then people can make the decisions that they feel best fit their circumstance. Yeah, for sure. And then just being able to have those resources available. And, you know, you kind of touch about like people going online and searching up their own information. Kind of what are, what are, what would you recommend? Like they go to what sites do you kind of advise them to go and what sites do you kind of tell them, um, don't kind of go to this side of the, of the internet, lean more towards these. <laughs> Um, are there yeah. any like websites in mind that that you would yeah. recommend for people to go? So the, the website I usually point people towards is thebody.com. I think it has a very um, balanced view from both the medical standpoint as well as patients who are HIV positive themselves who share their stories. Um, it has information about medications. It has information about side effects about some of those medications. Um, so I think those are um, great. Um, I don't really know. I think there's probably too many sites to list of sites not to go to, but I think you have to sort of use your discernment about where that information is coming from. Um, I think that local health departments are going to provide you with the most accurate information. Um, big um, sort of healthcare or, or, um, or HIV organizations that work in the community, community-based organizations like EOCIL, uh, like Partnership Project, like uh, Cascades, um, you know, those um, um, AIDS, H HIV Alliance, those are some amazing organizations that have been doing work um, in the communities for a very, very long time. And they do great work. Um, I work with a couple of folks from, from, um, from the, uh, different organizations. And I think they have really great balanced ways to provide information. Um, I think that they're great. As I said, if you're sort of going to sort of google.com and, you know, it's yeah. some random sort of website, you know, one person living out in somewhere else and it's like, you know, HIV is, you know, this and this, and, you know, you don't have to take meds and you just have to sort of, you know, drink uh, apple juice with apple cider yeah. or something. That's probably not the website that you want to get your Yeah. Um, and there are websites like that. There are definitely websites that say that, you know, um, you know, HIV was created to sort of, you know, as a conspiracy. There are websites that talk about natural therapies. Um, and unfortunately, I can tell you that I've had patients who've believed some of those things and they've gotten sick and some have died, unfortunately. And so um, going to your big healthcare organizations, um, going to places like, you know, the CDC, um, you know, some places may require maybe a certain amount of um, health literacy to sort of understand everything. But again, you can sort of, you know, dig around and find places that kind of, you know, answer your question. At the end of the day. Yeah, for sure. I know, I know here at our offices, like if someone were to come in, we have a lot of brochures that we've made. We have a lot of like kits that they could take home that have a variety of things like condoms, male and female, which to my understanding, I, I'm completely, I didn't even know female condoms were a thing. I just found that out the other day. So, you know, mm -hmm. We have a lot of great stuff here that that can really help prevent the spread of HIV, practicing safe sex from condoms, male and female, lubrication, pamphlets. We have a bunch of little cards that will direct you to different organizations that will help help you in this in this journey that you're on. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely definitely great to be able to 
encourage people to come in and just get educated even if even if you already know a lot just come in say hi to us uh, yeah. we don't bite uh <laughs> we'll love to sit down and chat i get tired of looking at a computer all day so come on in and I'll, I'll i'll be more than happy to talk to you about anything and everything just educate people on what it is that we do why it's important uh this is the main thing why it's important because it's a serious problem mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things you said um, before, and just to kind of highlight, it, it's also, it seems it's done in a non-judgmental way. Yeah. You know, I think that, you know, as, as a doctor, um, I hear a lot of very personal and sensitive stories. And it's so important to create that environment where people feel comfortable to have those conversations. Um, and, you know, you, you try, you do it without judgment, you do it with an eye that, you try to provide the person with the best guidance so that they can make healthy, healthier choices for their for their overall um, um, sort of health. And so, you know, that's what we do, and that's what we should do. Um, so, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's great. And you know, just kind of wrapping up, because um, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Is so, is there any like final thoughts on, you know, kind of what we talked about? You know, you know, the floor is yours. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh boy, I don't get this uh, opportunity all the time, but thank you. Um, no, I, as I said, you know, we've come a long way. We've come a long way from when I trained and where we are today. Um, HIV is um, a chronic um, uh, infection. Um, it is treatable. Um, there are no cures, but people can live a very long, healthy life. Um, we've come a long way in terms of therapeutics where for some people, they can be on one tablet a day. Some people can take an injectable. Um, we know that U equals U, then undetectable um, equals untransmittable. We know that if you are HIV positive and you are on medications and you are undetectable and you're pregnant, you will have an, an HIV negative child. And so we've just really come a long way for um, changing the conversation um, to make sure that people are um, empowered. We need to have these conversations again in a um, in a non-judgmental, safe space. Um, and you shouldn't feel that you know you know that being HIV positive that there's anything that you've done, people have done wrong. Um, we should really take out of our language clean and dirty because that's not what it is. Um, and so, and so, yeah, and again, no one should be stigmatized for, as you, I think you mentioned about, you know, oh, you know, if someone has, you know, if you're having a lot of partners or promiscuous, I mean, those, land, those things should be taken off a conversation. As I said, I've had folks who've had HIV, who've had one partner, I've had patients who are HIV negative, who've had hundred partners. And it's not for me to judge or to give judgment. I just want to make sure that everyone's safe and able to find information that's, uh, that reflects what they need in their lives. So that's all. <laughs> all right. Oh, that's awesome. And, and well, I just want to thank you again so much for taking your time and, you know, I hope the people listening really were able to take something, if anything, from this, just being inclusive, being non non judgmental, just being, you know, being there for people who, who are going through a hard time discussing or, you know, this, the whole HIV process, mm -hmm. just because I, I'm learning a lot and I'll be the first to admit my mistakes and take, take responsibility for it because that was my, my thinking when I was in high school, that was the way I, I spoke about it about people and you know i've grown i've grown a lot i like to say but there's still always room for growth so i want to thank you so much again and well um, kind of where are you guys located your offices do you have multiple offices so we are located our main office is at the university so on sam jackson which is the on the hill at ohsu um we work with um you know many different case management organizations and so as I said, we have some amazing clinicians here who've been doing this work for quite a while. And we have a lot of um, great support staff that help us to give great quality care. And yeah, if you ever want to come up and see us, or if you ever have questions about it, that, please reach out to us at the HIV Clinic at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, and we're more than happy to help guide. If we don't have the answer, then we'll try to connect you with someone who has the answer. All righty. Well, well, thank you so much, Dr. Christopher Evans. And um, thank you for everyone listening. This has been the EOCIL podcast. If you have any other questions, feel free to stop by our, one of our offices in Burns, Pendleton, The Dalles, or Ontario.
or visit us online at eocil.org.